Welcome back, everybody. Our sponsor today is IMI. IMI offers a comprehensive line of products to increase pharmacy efficiency and safety. All IMI products are manufactured in the United States at their FDA registered ISO certified facility under the strictest quality standards. My guests today are Amanda Hayes and Becky Deerhoff. Amanda is a pharmacist and currently working for BD as the Director of Medical Affairs. Becky is a nurse and the Director of Patient Safety, Risk Management and Compliance at Barnes Jewish Hospital. Today we're gonna to be discussing just culture and how it can be applied to suspected diversion. Now, for those of you listening that maybe aren't familiar with Just Culture, I'm just gonna give you a quick overview. And I'm sure Becky and Amanda will interject and correct me if I, if I misspeak on anything, so I'm certainly not the expert. But I have used it. It is an excellent algorithm to assist with evaluating an event and then narrowing down the event to one of three types of behaviors. And I would use it routinely when I was in my role of medication safety officer. So for medication errors is when I would whip out that algorithm. The three, um, in the case of medication errors, action taken toward the healthcare professional that made the error should be based on the behavior behind the error and not the outcome. So it doesn't matter if there's patient harm or not patient harm, it's based on the behavior. The three behavior choices are number one, human error, which is made because we're all humans and we make mistakes. There was no intention to make the error, but it was made because we're fallible. The second behavior is at risk behavior. And that is when a person chooses to do something because maybe they've lost the discernment of the risk associated with the action, or they believe the risk to be insignificant. Culture becomes tolerant to certain at-risk behaviors, and um, they move toward being the norm instead of being risky. So an example might be scanning a medication after administration rather than before. We all know the only way to prevent a med error with scanning is to scan it before you give it, right? But if you've scanned it after a few times and there's no negative consequences, then we kind of begin to lose that discernment of the risk associated. And maybe the culture of the unit has been one that, you know, doesn't really matter. We just need to get our 100% barcode scanning and as long as we do it, nothing bad has ever happened. In those cases with at-risk behavior, coaching and a system redesign are typically recommended actions. Now the third type of behavior is reckless behavior. And that is one where there's a conscious disregard of the substantial and unjustifiable risk. In a 2020 article by ISMP, they actually list drug diversion as reckless behavior. Reckless behavior is blameworthy and disciplinary actions need to be considered. I heard Amanda and Becky speak on the just culture as it relates to diversion. So that's the discussion that we're gonna have today. And I will tell you that I've, I've spoken with them a couple of times and I've asked a lot of questions because it was kind of hard for me to wrap my brain around some of what they said. And so that's what we're gonna try to do today is clarify some of that and give you some of those answers. So I'm gonna uh, welcome to you both. Um, you. Becky, I'm gonna start with you. And I know you work with a just culture on a regular basis throughout your day. And I know the two of you used to work together and that's where the connection is. So Becky, share with us some of your thoughts on just culture principles. And is there ever a time that we would use that algorithm and not consider suspected diversion as reckless behavior. Let's talk about that. All right, uh, so thank you for having us and continuing this conversation. I think that um, what we are trying to propose and change the dialogue around is kind of the basic assumptions. Um, the most uh, algorithms or the typical algorithms you see um, that are uh, referenced in literature 
are, are what you've described, right? It, it's trying to, we have a unexpected, un, unwanted outcome, and we are trying to investigate and, and understand and appreciate, you know, human error versus the quality of our choices. And if, um, I would say the assumption is that uh, the individual that's that's being looked into, or the or the group of individuals, uh, there's an assumption of competency. Of you know, I'm competent to make a choice. Um, I can. Um, I'm I'm acting on the best interests of you know my organization while I'm at work. Uh, I think you know when you look at the algorithm and you uh, look and appreciate the questions that they ask. Those are the those are the baseline assumptions. So when they say, you know, was the duty to follow this rule known to the employee? Okay, and, and typically, uh, in these types of investigations, the answer is what? Yes, yes. We, you did know that you know these medications are intended, are prescribed, and intended to be given to patients. Um, you know, was it possible to follow the rule? Right? And that's where mm -hmm. we look into uh, system uh, design right. or the, the risky behaviors. I think that what we want to look at is a different um, version of the algorithm. And the one that we mentioned uh, during our presentation was an adaptation uh, made by Al Frankel and Michael Leonard, Leonard, who are both anesthesiologists by training, and they're both um, IHI faculty. They've been doing patient safety work for decades. And um, they published a modified version of the Just Culture algorithm, which first and foremost, ask the question if there's impairment. And then you, and if there is impairment, so the, if the person is making a, a choice uh, without being impaired and is competent, then you follow the, the just culture algorithm. You know, if they know that they're stealing and are selling or whatever they're doing and they're not, it's not um, under a substance use disorder, then you follow that algorithm. I think what we want to highlight and have the conversation is that people assume that because individuals who have chronic substance use disorder appear to be fully functioning, you mm -hmm. can drive, you can get dressed, you can uh, arrive at work on time, then therefore you are, you're competent, your decisions and the quality of your choices can be evaluated by the traditional sense. And I think, uh, Amanda, uh, would you want to expand yeah. on those assumptions? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, just taking a step back, like, we know that 10 to 15% of healthcare workers at some point have a dependency or excessive use of either drugs or alcohol. And with that, you know, we don't really know the exact number that go on to divert. And we also understand the subsequent patient safety risks. So please remember that nothing that Becky and I are talking about is to negate any of those issues that exist in the baseline workforce, nor the risk, potential risk to patients. Um, but I think when you think of especially what's happened over the last three years in the healthcare workforce, they've had extreme amounts of stress beyond what has ever been seen in the healthcare workforce. COVID-19, the impact of that, subsequent burnout of healthcare professionals who were seeking to either leave the profession altogether or uh, seek new opportunities outside of what they were normally doing. Um, on top of labor shortages, it all adds to a, an increased stressful work environment uh, with very sick patients. And then we also know from looking at the literature and from national guidelines that addiction is described as a chronic and relapsing disorder and not a moral failing. And that's according to the National Institute of Drug uh, Addiction. And so knowing that it is kind of a chronic disease, it is a chronic treatable disease, I think it's important to keep that in context as we talk about this. Um, the other thing I would say is that for individuals who do have substance use disorder, the chemical changes that happen in their brain directly impact their ability to make conscious decisions. Uh, so as an example, uh, the pleasure center in the brain or the basal ganglia is impacted where such that anything but the medication or drugs that they are seeking as a part of their use is actually impacted dramatically. The decision centers um, are also impacted and it imp increases stress over time for these individuals, increases anxiety. And then the, as I mentioned, the prefrontal cortex, which 
empowers your decision making, conscious decision making, self control, again, all dramatically impacted by substance use disorder. Um, so while you see with the disease of uh, addiction and substance use disorder that it may be an initial choice to try a medication, um, subsequent use really leads to self-control challenges, uh, more of that reward um, from using the substance. And then over time, as it goes into habitual use, the expected behavioral uh, norms lessen, the risk of drug diversion potentially increases. Um, and at that point in time, it's difficult to say based on the science that we know today that these individuals are really capable of making a, an appropriate conscious decision. Um, we've also seen professional organizations come out and speak about this because of the fact that for many, many years, uh, we lived in a punitive environment. Um, so now at, at today's contemporary thinking um, from both the American Society of Health System Pharmacy, the American Nurse Association, as well as the American Society of Addiction Medicine, which talks specifically about healthcare workers who are impaired, fundamentally talks about that they have um, a, a relapsing chronic condition, um, but that the punitive actions taken should be considered based on um, some of the other. It's not to say that they can't have punitive action, um, but to kind of be more empathetic about the disease that these individuals are facing. And so I think all that's important to keep in the context as we talk about just culture, uh, because again, if we start the algorithm, algorithm discussion with, is the individual impaired? it will quickly be apparent that maybe they're not making a conscious decision because they are under the influences of substances. Yeah, that all makes sense. I think something that Becky said is maybe part of what throws us off and that is they're coming to work and they're working and you're working right alongside them. And in many cases, sometimes just because peers don't know what to look for, or we try to justify it with other things going on in their life that we know are going on, but the fact remains is many times you will hear from a manager or a peer or something, no, they're one of the best nurses that we have. So if they can make the appropriate, shall we say, decisions, right, to get them there, to do their charting, to, um, you know, work, then how can we argue that they aren't in control of, some of the actions that they take. And so I think that is something that um, does kind of throw us off a little bit in terms of accountability. Yeah, I think, you know, if you think about an individual who had maybe a workplace injury and is coming uh, or openly disclosed upon hire that they had um, a medication that they were taking daily that was a controlled substance, they were not gonna pass their higher drug screen, right? I think it's important to think of how you address those situations as you also think about this. Um, many mm -hmm. organizations do allow for individuals who have a valid prescription for certain medications to be allowed to continue uh, to work so long as their performance is is meeting expectations with appropriate um, you know, appropriate safeguards in place. Um, we also have seen a lot more openness around individuals who are recover in recovery and on chronic um, treatment for medication um, assist medication assistance for uh, those with opioid use disorder. Mm -hmm. And those individuals may even be allowed to continue gainful employment while uh, being actively treated for that in, in many uh, organizations. So in those cases, those individuals are also uh, being treated with a medication. I think the one difference is that looking at the desire, desired craving and the desired need uh, for the medication, which uh, in these individuals may be outweighing um, some of the other some of the their other needs right so uh, they are maybe not making decisions because the the primary craving is that medication that they're desiring uh, which often may be the reason that they tip into drug diversion and opportunity it, plus access yeah, plus right. you know that that unfortunate state of illness and and seeking the medication over other uh, appropriate social norms um, is, is something that I think we do see as the, as the disease progresses. Yeah, I guess that is the difference, right? I mean, there's the working impaired. So why are you impaired? Is it your prescription med that you're not abusing, but it's, mm -hmm. I mean, the dose is too high perhaps, or, you know, the way you're responding to it, maybe it's a new treatment plan and, um, or alcohol, of course, there's that too. And then there's the, you know, I am on something, 
but I do function. And then there's the craving. So all three of those are somebody who is taking something while they're working, but the difference is, um, I guess a lot of it is the craving piece of it. Um, okay. So with this new, this different algorithm in terms of if you, I mean, I guess, how do you go about it? So if you think that there's an issue, you have to do a little differentiating before you decide which path to go. So do you know that? How far into the investigation, like what is your process if you think there might be some sort of controlled substance um, involved? This wouldn't apply to diversion of non-controls, right? That that would be more of a, a theft probably for money or it could be self-treatment, but not a craving. Like you couldn't, they know what they're doing, right? Um, so how do you go about you've got someone, you think something may be going on, you're not sure yet, you're just starting, what is the process? Becky, do you wanna take a, a shot at that at first and I'll add in? <laughs> well, I would, I would say that um, I think the first, the first step is having you know, some policies in place and I think this is timely because I think on the listserv somebody was asking about impairment policy um, so I think that, you know, the first thing is to have a process and policies to address what do you do, you know, for employees who are found to be impaired. And then it should back up and support um, if there's discrepancies and a diversion, you know, concern. And, you know, in the absence of those, uh, which many of us have, don't have those policies in place, you know, we're left with, uh, you know, prior decisions as precedent and therefore you know there's nothing to really prevent us from working our way backward from the algorithm you know if we want if we want to say well stealing is stealing or every choice is going to be evaluated uh, regardless of impairment then you know we, we will we will end up with reckless as a deciding point um, and maybe some of our policies which i think you know we've talked about before actually support termination um, you know so if, if our policies support you know, uh, punitive action, then that's what you're going to get out of this process. And I think right. that that is, it's really about looking at, you know, the state that you're practicing in, um, and then looking and really taking a look at your local policies um, to, to start there. Amanda. I think the one other thing I would add is, you know, over my years as being a medication safety officer, I often found myself wanting to jump straight into the algorithm uh, the second I identified a problem. And that's really not the best way to approach it. You really need to have completed your investigation, darn near completed it at least, so that you can then appropriately go through it because you really don't know all the facts until mm -hmm. you've completed interviews, collected the data, maybe even had a conversation with the individual. Um, you know, I, personally, when I've done some of these interviews with individuals who were suspected or um, identified as individuals that we should have a conversation with about potential for drug diversion, if they disclose in that moment, I think then it may change how you approach your application of the algorithm, right? So I think I would say, in like most things, wait until you have all the facts before you try to determine final outcome or approach that you're going to take uh, to address the issues. So whether that be a medication error or in this case, a drug diversion case. Yeah, that's a good point. I think that 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 is something that you start to learn with experience when you're first starting in any of this diversion or med safety or anywhere where a conclusion, I mean, actually life too, I guess, is we can be really quick to like, well, that's it. I mean, that's so obvious. And the more we do it, the more we get little curveballs and surprises. And then we start to realize and actually, you know, then it becomes more natural to just, well, wait, we're not done yet. You know, let's finish. Um, even when somebody else is saying, well, what could be the possible, you know, excuse for that? It's like, well, you would be surprised what may happen, um, what you may uncover. So that makes sense. Now, is the approach the same? Let's say that you don't think that there's diversion involved at all, but it looks like there's impairment. Is there a difference there? You're, you're, you've concluded your, your investigation now. There was clear impairment. Somebody was exhibiting it. But it, from what you can see, and they have not admitted to diverting at all, 
Is, is there a different pathway for that? I mean, I guess I would think of that one more as what is your organization's policy uh, as it relates to on the on the workplace impairment, right? And how you approach that. Oftentimes, uh, again, if it hadn't been for initial suspected diversion, that you know that where where they would be kicked out of the algorithm essentially. Um, I think in those cases, they they may be treated differently based on your organization's policies. I know, having spoken with many, many folks across the country, though, we're starting to see more of that kind of gentler EAP offered approach for folks. So employee assistance programs as a first step of that intervention, um, perhaps they're placed on a probationary period, your analysis is performed, and at that time they're offered EAP and encouraged to try to address whatever issues, provide uh, prescription uh, validation if they're, if, it, if it's in fact, in fact an illicit substance that's been prescribed for them. So I think in those cases, you know, again, many factors can go into how those individuals are treated. But I've seen a little bit more of a supportive culture even for those individuals than perhaps in my you know, past 20 years. Um, I'd say you know, I've seen a big shift from immediate termination of those individuals as well. Yeah, because I, you know, I don't know. I guess it's, it, I'm trying to think, like if you have diversion, are you going to have impairment? I would say yes, right? Do you think, or you think you could have one without the other? You think you could absolutely. have one without the other? I have seen diversion with absolutely no self-use of the medication. Well, that's true. Okay, so I'm gonna take that off the table. Let's say it is because you have a substance use disorder and you have diverted. It's possible, of course, you're just taking it home with you and it's your like weekend use maybe. So I guess from that perspective, it's possible. And then you have your people that don't seem to be acting impaired, but it must be influencing something if that craving is so high that you can't resist the, the need to take it, right? Um, so if you have an impaired person, whether it's alcohol or drugs that is working and you can clearly see it, you have a person who has a substance use disorder and they cannot stop themselves from taking it. So you kind of go with the assumption that they are impaired in some way, whether it's withdrawals, trying to offend something is not right. Do you think that hospitals should have different policies the, the process should be different within each of those circumstances, or do they really come together? Because either way, you've got patients that are in danger, facilities that are in danger with a liability, and you've got a healthcare professional who is in danger and needs help. So do you see, would you suggest that the policies handle them differently? or really one in the same, it doesn't matter. The only difference in this case is whether they stole something. Yeah, I mean, I think it's up to organizational values um, and what, what level of comfort they have with supporting those individuals that are seeking recovery or interested in recovery, right? And so again, having kind of seen that shift over the past 20 years of my career, I think, um, you know, and from my personal experiences, right? Um, my early days in my career, I worked with several individuals that were diverting controlled substances and some of them being really, really close individuals to me. And I think that shaped a lot of my belief system in the potential for recovery. I'm proud to say that a couple of those folks are well over 20 years into recovery. I know others that are 10 to 15 years into recovery, still actively participating in AA and NA meetings. And some of those are even sponsors now for other healthcare workers. And so, you know, my value system may be different than an organization's value system as it relates to belief in the possibility of recovery for these individuals. Um, so I, I do think it is an organizational 
discussion that has to happen from all angles because you know uh, Becky and I are both very passionate about this side of it but you may have conversations with your with your legal counsel who may have a different view or your or media right um, that you know your individuals who support customer or, or external optics around what your organization would go through should there be a diversion right they may have different um, value statements and value beliefs than you that may shape your organizational policies so yeah all very true and that's one of the reasons i have these podcasts because to try to get the the more we hear about real life cases and situations and recovery and <clears throat> successful reintegration programs and stuff the more people you know start to hear that it's possible these are people um and hopefully it, there's a shift in the way, you know, they start to look at things too. Okay, so you've determined that there is substance use disorder, there's some diversion. What does this different um, algorithm say aside from these, you know, three behaviors that I went through? What does this other process tell you to do? at that point, <laughs> direct it, you to do, it, suggest it that you it do. It basically, you know, suggests that you work with risk, HR, your own <laughs> policies. I mean, it, kind of to be determined. I think that, that we've just been talking about, uh, we've just been talking about kind of what that could look like. Um, they don't, they don't define it. Um, again, it's, it's, it's really okay. based on uh, elevating, elevating the, the conversation and, you know, kind of challenging uh, the more traditional approaches to this. I think okay. the interesting thing is, as Becky's answering that, that really makes me pause for a second is remembering that the individuals who developed this draft of an algorithm were anesthesiologists. Mm -hmm. Historically, um, you know, they have been recognized as a group that has a higher potential, um, you know, whether that or not that's validated fully in the literature with, with real data, uh, I think remains to be seen broadly. But I think at the same time, healthcare professionals that work in certain areas have not always been treated consistently, right? So you may see a different approach for nursing and pharmacy versus physicians, mm -hmm. um, where physician reintegration into the workforce is often a, a primary goal, uh, depending on their commitment to recovery versus nursing and pharmacy pharmacy, which may have a different uh, path. And so I think, you know, kind of thinking that through, it makes a little bit more sense of why um, there's been some advocacy around, hey, think of this differently, because recognizing that they are, again, under the influence of a substance at the time that a subsequent actions occurred, um, I think it's important to think of that uh, as, as why, how your organization would approach it, because uh, you know, if you're going to segment out disciplines, uh, does that really make the most sense at the end of the day? Um, when fundamentally you're either you're either committed to a value system that allows reintegration, or your uh, or your firm on reckless behavior and subsequent consequences therein. Yeah, agreed. It shouldn't matter. Um, I guess the whole point is that they no longer fall in the standard just culture, and that's what we need to remember. It's not the reckless or at-risk behavior because it just doesn't fall under that anymore. And then that's where our policies and procedures and our risk and legal and knowing ahead of time how you're going to handle it as opposed to just on the fly, then figuring it out. Yeah, yep, okay. absolutely. And, and, and have it, you know, fair and equitable across yes. all roles. Yes, yes, which also makes a big difference ahead of time is that this is what you, how you have defined it. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. Okay. All right, anything else you guys uh, wanna? Jerry, I'd say one of the questions I've had and interested in really just having a discussion with Becky mm -hmm. about this is, you know, what happens when there's potential tampering that could directly mm. lead to patient safety risks, potentially bloodborne pathogen, right? Um, I know in my past experiences that leads to some, what I would call outcome bias, right? Uh, you've directly done harm to a patient or potentially done harm to a patient. And should that still fall the same algorithm that we just discussed? And I personally feel that that one is, is complicated, right? It adds a layer of complexity uh, to what we just discussed that I think it kind of goes back to, you know, is, is where does your organization's values? Do they continue to believe more in the support for individuals who are, who are under the influence uh, or do they value the patient's values? And I think it is really complicated. I don't know that there's a right answer um, 
that just Becky, I'm interested in your random thoughts on this because <laughs> that's a good one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think, I think whenever you insert any uh, outcome bias that we, ha we have a tendency to, um, treat the individuals differently. And that's, and, you know, that's part of, you know, when you're learning just culture to be aware of the biases that we all have. Um, and to, to, again, to have a consistent team that's working on this. So, you know, I work with teams of individuals who we keep ourselves accountable so that we don't allow ourselves just to go down a pathway because we're all emotionally tied or we have um, individuals that are, um, you know, potentially demanding uh, different outcomes because, you know, it, it involves patient and disclosure in those conversations. Um, so I think that's, in my mind, it's critical to um, have the consistency and um, a team that is diverse and committed to, one, knowing um, that they might be falling down a hindsight outcome bias pathway um, and to, to really mitigate that. Um, and, you know, I think we, we actually, you know, acknowledge uh, when there is a potentially uh, bad outcome involving patients that we have to acknowledge that um, this, is, this is a factor in this investigation and we, we need to address that just as humans. Like we are upset, you know, uh, we're, we, we might be grieving uh, and have empathy with the patient and the family that, if, or families that were involved, right? And the, and the impact of the reputation and, and all that goes with um, that dynamic. Yeah, that was a good question, Amanda. Thanks for asking that. I, I think too, just because we are advocating for some compassion and some empathy doesn't mean we are saying there shouldn't be accountability and consequences, right? So you can still try to get that person help and be empathetic for the fact that they do have a substance use disorder. They were not in control necessarily of what they were doing. It got very out of control that it got to the point where it was tampering and they may have to face those legal consequences, but that doesn't have to take away the empathy piece of that interaction and you know, working to, to try to get them some help as well. But you're right, it's hard to just like, oh, how could you yeah. do that? And I think I think I'll add, you know, the importance of speaking to the the individuals involved, because I, I will say that, um, you know, you might you might have individuals uh, who put patients harm in way intentionally, and that's not what we see in these investigations. You see people with substance use disorders who are not wanting to cause harm, right? It just it it was it was a byproduct of um, right. the impact of their quality decisions. Right. But, but you have to you have to engage them. You can't assume that uh, their what their intent was. Mm. I mean, so I think that's a critical piece to, to this process as well. You don't get to answer all those questions on the algorithm. That's not how it was intended. And that's not how it was designed. It's you have to actually talk to the individual involved to appreciate where they were coming from when they okay. made those decisions. Yeah. And that goes back to don't jump to any conclusions until you have gone through the entire thing. Because sometimes we're surprised, really surprised. <laughs> yeah. All right. This is great. Well, I want to thank you both for the discussion today. It was, um, I think it was a great discussion. And thank you, everybody, for listening. Please hit that subscribe button. And I do want to thank our sponsor, whose product line is an active det deterrent to diversion. To see IMI's complete line of innovative tamper-evident products and how they work, check them out at imiweb.com. Thank you, Amanda and Becky, for your time today. Thank you, Terry. Thanks.